Early in the course, we showed this video of amazing real-world motion, a situation where some daring rock climbers were swinging on a very long climbing rope. Today we're going to discuss how to construct computer models that could be used as a starting point to describe and to predict motion in some extreme sports involving ropes. To do this, we're going to apply both of the fundamental principles we have discussed. In this lecture, we'll start with Newton's second law. You may wish to review an earlier lecture where we started with observations of motion on a rope swing, constructed a model, and applied Newton's second law to learn about the forces involved. We'll use many of the same ideas here. However, one big difference is that here we will start with specifying the forces and use Newton's second law to predict motion. Let's start by representing our climber as an object with some mass m, which we choose as our system. To predict the motion, we need to specify the net force acting on the system by accounting for all significant interactions of the mass with the surroundings. As we discussed in our earlier lecture, both the weight force and the rope force need to be included. As before, we'll describe the weight force as being proportional to the mass. For the rope force, we want to account for the fact that real climbing ropes, or ropes used in bungee jumping, stretch by a significant amount. We remember that, at a microscopic level, the force exerted by a rope, the tension, is due to stretching bonds that we can think of as spring-like forces, and we can think of an entire rope as consisting of many parallel chains of atoms with spring-like forces between each atom. Now it can be shown that parallel chains of springs like this can be replaced by one spring, so this suggests that we can model the rope as a gigantic spring and therefore we can describe the rope force acting on the mass as a spring force acting on the mass. We know that the force exerted by the spring is proportional to the amount the spring is stretched, and we know how to express the spring force as a vector. So now we have a simplified model, a mass hanging from a spring. Now for the rest of this lecture and the next lecture and the upcoming lab, we're going to analyze videos of motion that we will then describe using this model. We'll say now up front that the videos will show the motion of a small mass attached to an actual spring rather than a climber on a rope. The reason for this is that we need to make sure that we can properly apply our motion physics principles to understand and to predict the simpler case of an actual spring in mass. Once we have that experience under our belt, we would then be in a position to try our hand at a problem like the rock climber on a rope swing. You will have the option, if you choose, to tackle that problem in our final lab, the Choose Your Own Adventure Lab. Let's take a look at one of the spring mass videos. Here at the beginning of the video, we see the mass is just hanging motionless. The mass is in static equilibrium. Then we see the mass is pulled down and released from rest. For this situation, we see that, for the most part, the mass's position oscillates in one dimension, up and down along the vertical. We begin by analyzing the motion of the mass using Tracker. We invite you to carry out this analysis for yourself. You can download the video using the link that should pop up now. First, we need to set the length scale, time scale, and coordinate system within Tracker. We'll discuss our choices here, and if you're following along at home, you'll need to insert these choices in just the same way that you have done in previous labs. To set the length scale, we use the distance from the attachment point to the center of mass when it is motionless, in static equilibrium. We measured this distance independently to be 0.70 meters. The time between frames in this video is 10.5 seconds. Be sure to check this in Tracker. It may already be set properly. If not, you will need to change this. We choose our coordinate system such that the origin is at the attachment point and we choose the y-axis to be aligned with the spring with the negative direction of the y-axis pointed downward. Next, let's select the video frames that we're going to analyze. We want to start our analysis when the motion starts. In this case, we want to find the video frame where the mass is just about to be released from rest. We can do this by clicking on the left arrow and dragging until we see the moment of release, which, in this video, we find to be frame 22. The frame number is shown by tracker in the box at the lower left. This is where we are starting our analysis of the observed motion, meaning starting from frame 22, we will mark the position of the mass in the video in the same manner as we have done in previous labs, 
And we will do this for all frames beginning from frame 22 onward. And so we get something like this. At this point, we are going to cut the position data, both the measured X and Y positions, and paste this into a spreadsheet. We'll save this data later in CSV format to a file named springmassdata underscore 1D.csv. Later, we'll compare our data with the motion predictions from the computer model we're going to build shortly. Before we get to that, we will need information from the spring mass experiment and observations in order to set up our model. We know to predict motion, we need the initial position and velocity. We know how to do this. We read off the initial position from our tracker analysis. Here, at the starting time of the observation, which we will call t equals zero, the y position is as shown circled here. Moreover, since the mass is released from rest, we know that the initial velocity is zero. To make predictions, we'll also need to know the mass of the object. We measure that independently to be 0 0.402 kilograms. We also need information to specify the interactions for our model. For the weight force, we will need, in addition to the mass, the strength of the gravitational field. For the spring force, we know from past lectures that we'll need both the spring stiffness K and the relaxed length L0. We're going to discuss now how to get those quantities from the video observations we already have in hand without doing any more experiments. First, you'll recall that we discussed in a recent video lecture that the period of oscillation for a spring mass system is given by this expression. Rewriting, we see that we can solve for an unknown spring stiffness if we know the mass which we have, and the period of oscillation. We can use our data to get the period. Here's one way. The period is just the time interval for one complete oscillation. So let's measure the time interval for a number of oscillations, say three. Say by starting here at release at t equals zero, and then looking three oscillations later when the mass is again at the lowest point in the oscillation. We take the corresponding time, and from that we can compute the average period which we find to be 1.524 seconds. Plugging this in, we estimate the spring constant to be 6.83 newtons per meter. Now we can use the observation of static equilibrium to find the relaxed length of the spring. Equilibrium means, as we discussed earlier, that the net force, the sum of the spring force and the weight force acting on the mass is zero. In other words, the magnitude of the spring force is equal to the magnitude of the weight force. Recall that in vector form, the spring force is given by this expression, where S is the difference between the stretched length and the relaxed length. Plugging this expression in and solving for the relaxed length L0, we have this result. Now we know all the quantities on the right-hand side, so plugging all this in, we find that the relaxed length L0 is 0 0.123 meters. We're now in a position to construct our computer model of the motion. Here's a Python program that you can use as a starting point. The link for this program should pop up now. If you run the program, you should see something like this if your program is running properly. In the display window, you should see a helix that represents the spring and a blue sphere to represent the mass. The yellow sphere at the top indicates the attachment point of the spring, which we choose here as the origin, consistent with our coordinate system choice in our video analysis. Taking a look at the program, we see at the top where the visualization and the graph are set up. To begin with, we don't need to edit anything here. However, notice that there are some lines that are commented out. For now, don't uncomment anything here or elsewhere in the program until we say so. We'll get back to these lines of code and discuss them later. The next set of lines in the code, as usual, involve the initial conditions and system properties. As you know, you'll need to edit these to put in the system mass and the initial position, velocity, and initial starting time, consistent with what we discussed earlier. Again, there are some lines commented out. We'll leave these alone and come back to them later. The next set of lines deal with other initialization that we need, including quantities that we need to specify the interactions. First, we see here where we specify the time step, delta t. As usual, we choose this small compared to the time scale of motion, which, as we discussed, is around 1.5 seconds. What we have chosen here is fine, so you can leave that alone. The next lines involving the spring interaction need to be edited to put in the spring stiffness. 
the relaxed length, and other quantities needed to specify the spring force as a vector. We'll pause the video here and give you a chance to do this yourself. Here's the code needed to specify correctly the spring force. Recall that the L vector gives both the length and orientation of the spring. The L vector points from the attachment point to the location of the mass. In Python vPython language, the spring attachment point is given by the variable spring.pause. So this is used to specify the vector L. Now in the same section for initialization, we see some lines of code for specifying initial energies of a system. We'll come back to these later. Next we come to the calculation loop where we make motion predictions. We'll skip the energy parts for now and focus on the place where we apply Newton's second law. As you know, we need to specify the interactions, the forces acting on the mass, then add them up, use Newton's second law to then predict the new velocity, and then use that to predict the new position. You'll need to add all this in to make proper motion predictions. Don't forget to correct the lines of code that update the spring force. Remember that as the mass moves, the spring force changes, so the same quantities describing the spring force we just discussed need to be put in here as well. There's one more line that updates the visualization of the spring, spring.axis. This line is correct, so you don't need to edit it. After you complete these edits correctly, when you run the program, you should see something like this. The mass is oscillating vertically in the visualization, so this looks right, at least qualitatively. We'll discuss how to make a direct comparison to the observations in our next lecture, but for now, we'll close by adding one more feature. Let's put in two arrows to visualize the spring force and the weight force. To do this, find these two sets of code and uncomment the lines so that they look like this. This code will create and display a blue arrow representing the spring force and a black arrow representing the weight. When we run the code, we see that the weight force in black always points down and the spring force in blue is always pointing up, meaning the spring is always longer than its natural length during the entire motion. In addition, as we run the code, we see that the weight doesn't change in magnitude, but the spring force does. The arrow representing the spring force is getting longer and shorter as the mass oscillates. What do you think the net force is doing? Try to reason this out for yourself. You can check your reasoning by adding one more arrow to represent the net force to visualize this in the computer model. We'll just mention here that the kind of motion we see in this case would be very much like the motion of a bungee jumper at the end of her jump as she is bobbing up and down at the end of the rope. Now we haven't said anything about the energy principle yet. We'll do that along with a more careful comparison of motion predictions to observations in our next lecture.